I'm going to mute everybody. Let's hope I remember how to do this. Okay? That week off has really damaged <coughs> us. It's terrible. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> okay. Oh, I need to look over there. Good evening. This is Strange Love, and I'm your host, Cami Chaos. Welcome, babies. Good evening, and welcome to Strange Love Live. I'm your host, Cami Chaos, and as always, I'm joined by Dr. Normal, who sometimes turns my microphone on. That happens every time we come back from a vacation, <laughs> from one week of vacation. So we have a vacation every time we do the show? Mm. Uh, something like that. Burn. I don't know. <laughs> this evening we are joined by Tyler Sticka. Hello. It's great to be here. Oh, yeah, he has to turn your microphone on, No, he's on. on too. He's on. I'm on. How you doing, Tyler? <laughs> oh, I'm doing great, Cammie. You know, for a long time we wanted to have you on the show. Really? But then when we haven't met someone in person, we forget to ask them. Absolutely. Because... Yeah. yeah, our world is tiny and small, and, and it doesn't Twitter do avatars it. are tiny and small too. They don't stick in your mind as much. No, and I was going to make some crack about it not encompassing the world wide web, but it does. But then at Web Visions, we had the chance to meet you. Yeah, it was. And a blast. your talk was one of the only talks I got a chance to at least pop in on. Oh, great! So I popped in for a few minutes, and then we even more wanted to have you on the show. And look, now you're here. Yeah, well, great. What do you want to talk about? Oh, geez, there's so much stuff we could talk about. Um, I guess one thing we could start with is uh, icons and social media. I mean, that's that's those are the sort of social media is the reason we're here, and uh, I think iconography and symbols have a tremendous impact on the experiences uh, we have and we share on the World Wide Web. And I spent an inordinate amount of time and energy uh, trying to design ones that are functional and work mm -hmm. and communicate the right message. So icons are not just used for things that, I mean, essentially an avatar is an icon for a person. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So why are there so many different names for icons? Why can't we just, <laughs> why can't we just choose something and keep it straight? Well, um, I think part of that is just the fact that users really shouldn't notice them or care about them very much. Um, mm -hmm. If they're doing their job, they're a little bit like typography and that, you know, when you're looking at a word, hopefully you're just reading it. You're not like going like, what's that font? Because that means that I guess the text wasn't very compelling. And, uh, or you're a font for or you're a freak, like or, like, like Brom. Brom. Yes, yeah. exactly right. Or, you know, me on occasion. But, uh, but yeah, so it's one of those things where, um, uh, like, it's great as an icon designer, or this goes for all design to some degree, if someone notices that you did great design. But mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's necessary at all. And in some ways, I feel like some design suffers when it's really preoccupied with trying to get noticed. Um, the, this happens a lot on the web. You see a lot of gorgeous websites that win a lot of design awards that a couple thousand people use, and then Craigslist, you know, looks like crap, but millions of people enjoy it every single day. So, you know, that's a great example of... Um, of why aesthetics and being noticed and acknowledged by the user aren't necessarily as important as it being functional. And that's true for iconography. You know, it, the challenge with iconography versus it's kind of like symbol design, where symbol design, as you see in street signs and all sorts of things, is merely designing very small encapsulated images to represent big concepts. Icons have an additional sort of limitation in that they have to exist. Icons, almost by their definition, have to kind of exist with the limitations of a computer, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes they are as small as... I've designed an icon set... Um, eight square pixels so literally like eight you know oh my gosh uh, i don't know what i can't do eight times eight right now it shows i'm not probably not <laughs> 64 thank you studio audience <laughs> uh 64 little dots you have to use to uh to get an image across but um but yeah so i did uh i recently um i work at mcafee and i got the chance to uh design a whole uh icon language for all of the products mm -hmm. and so i went in with a set of as i said before limitations uh, certain things not only related to how the icons are going to be applied but also the branding um, mm -hmm. 
you know, there are certain constraints with not only do you have to get a symbol across, but then you have to make sure that, that all the different symbols somehow fit with the rest of the brand. And so I designed this basically this big booklet that uh, that. Uh, it was essentially detailing how to create iconography that was based on this sort of master set. So I created a shield that uh, that isn't just a flat shield. It will look right and in dimension uh, with a uh, user's operating system and their computing experience. And um, you see these things sort of take on a life of their own because what the user should be thinking about is what the icon represents, not what it uh, is in itself. So you see this a lot with things like Twitter. You know, the <laughs> birds and the color blue have essentially been appropriated by Twitter. And every time you see a bird that's blue, yeah. you think about Twitter now. They own that now. You know, in many ways, Google owns the uppercase G, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, and so these are things that have become... Google's actually an interesting one because uh, Google actually have a really hard time trying to use their uh, their iconography and normalize it. You, uh, Google um, have tremendously good user experiences, but uh, they've polarized a bunch of users with their new uh, fave icon design, which is a little tiny image that you see in the browser window. Mm -hmm. And they changed it to this weird, like, red green uh, blue thing that looks like kind of like a Mondrian threw up or something like that. I mean, it's really abrasive, and uh, and you know, and even that was at the end of this huge contest where they just took user submissions. So it can be a very difficult thing to do. I mean, that shows that a company as amazing as Google and that big can still struggle creating a sixteen pixel, uh, sixteen square pixel image that encapsulates everything. So let me ask you: when when a company <laughs> has had an icon for a certain period of time, and it's the same thing with an individual user as well with their avatar, and people really, really be and to associate the face with the name or the image with the brand. Sure. What do they risk then when they go, oh, I think we want to change it? Is it just, I mean, is it change for the sake of change is bad in that case? Oh, yeah, I would say absolutely. And that kind of goes back to logo design, too. A lot of companies, because I do a lot of logo design as well, and a lot of companies, they feel like changing that will somehow change their image. And that's mm -hmm. not true. Um, iconography and logo design and brand in general should be a reflection of, if not what you're sort of image is, but where you want it to be and where you're actively pushing for it to be. Mm -hmm. And so I think that in cases um, such as uh, uh um, with with companies like Google and everything like that, I think the reason they stick so much to the to the image to the G and everything, even though a lot of designers know that it's kind of an ugly logo, is that uh, you know it feels earnest and it matches the friendliness of their brand and everything. But um, some companies, if they change it a lot, it can kind of be like if every time you saw someone at a party, they changed completely their hairstyle and everything. Mm -hmm. And you might find that interesting depending on your audience, or you could go like, what's this guy about? You know, one day he comes in with a mohawk and the next day he's wearing hip hop gear. You know, is he really who he says he is? Yeah. And you can see this sometimes there was a great iPhone application called Byline. Uh, I say was, there is a great application called it's Byline. It's not dead yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And uh, it's a uh, RSS reader, and it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And they had an icon that was a little generic looking, and so they changed it to something that they wanted to be a lot more distinctive and linked to the name, and it was a stylized B inside a black square. Mm -hmm. But it completely contrasted with everyone's home screens. It looked like nothing else and not in a great way. It was just kind of like... Like it a was, sore thumb. Yeah, it was self-serving in a way, because it was like they took away the iconography, the imagery, and they replaced it with just them. And it was a little bit self-absorbed. So, And they to their credit, completely acknowledged it, and uh, recently they, they debuted a new icon that's more representative of what it does rather than what they they want it to be, and it fits in with the icon. So it's a, it's a big thing, you know, because when they did that, all there were all these low uh, reviews on the App Store basically saying, you know, great, but the icon's horrible and all this stuff. I've so. never heard anyone describe an icon as being self-absorbed, <laughs> but I think that's really interesting because in, in, you know, in this day and age, where people really do associate companies and people with their icon and with just this one small image. Sure. You have to be able to get a large amount of visual impact from an itty bitty little square. Right. What right. do you think is the best way to go about doing that? Well, the best thing, of course, is to concentrate on the message. What do you want people to get out of mm -hmm. it? If it's something like Google where they're so broad, you probably want to get their name more than anything. So using a letter or a character like that um, is reasonable. When you have something like the byline application where it's kind of 
it's not really a content provider. It's kind of a means to get at your Google reader feeds. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't have as much of an identity at stake. It should probably go more towards the function. And when in doubt, uh, go simpler rather than more complex, um, especially with website fave icons. I notice a lot of people try to cram. They'll take uh, like, uh, remember the milk's a good example. Remember the milk is a great to-do so list. It's a cow. The cow, I yeah. saw, yeah. And the cow is great, actually. I mean, some people scoff at it because it's sort of, I guess, amateurish looking might be too mean a word, it's but it's cute. hand drawn, it's cute. And uh, But they just kind of smushed it for their icon and called that a solution. So I actually did a redesign where I thought about the space. So it's really thinking about the message you want to send and then making the most of those 16 square pixels. And you know, I mentioned that icons can be self-absorbed, and with Twitter avatars and people's avatars online, you can notice the same thing. It says a lot about you, especially since social media, we're all kind of becoming brands in a way, and we're mm -hmm. branding ourselves. And uh, so there was this one trend that I kind of mocked for a while, which was like everybody did these little anime Twitters for oh, avatars for a while. God. Yeah, and um, that's I, a really good example of everyone I, being individual together. I hated that. <laughs> yeah, they all looked the same. No one's looked like it, and it just felt really like... Um, but if you actually try to do... My favorite avatars are the ones that are kind of a straightforward image of either someone in their element or someone just looking really just kind of earnestly honest or something. So... Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Aaron Hockley's avatar, where it's just him with a camera, you know, I think yours right now is you interviewing on this show with the blue behind you. It's, uh, yeah, it's from when we did the show at the top of the hill. Right. Yeah. And so they just, uh, those, they show this is a person and this is them in their element. I like a lot of avatars. It's just a person just smiling or something like that, not trying to be cutesy or anything, but just kind of like, here I am. Like, it can look cool. You know, it can be an illustration or something like that. But, is, um, your new one is an illustration. It is. Yeah, yeah. I actually had to do illustrations. But of it my, looks like you. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, just having it be earnest and honest, I think, is something. But, of course, of course, avatars are a whole different kettle of worms. Yeah, then. now I just want to pull out my iPhone and make you like critique everyone's avatars, and that's <laughs> not necessarily the nicest thing that we could do on the show. But maybe, yeah, maybe we can do that during after hours. Absolutely, absolutely. But yeah. So the whole iconography works really, really heavily into social media. Do you think more so than if you're? It's. I mean, it's always been a part of branding you you drive down the road and there's a billboard and sure. you recognize the logo i mean the biggest example of that i've seen lately and i find it really obnoxious on the way to the airport i keep seeing these giant snickers bars oh right and With then the you look at it and it says something completely different and i'm just like right i find it obnoxious but at the same time i have to give snickers credit because my favorite commercial of all time has nothing to do with Snickers, right? but it's a Snickers commercial, and it sticks in my mind, and mm -hmm. it's from like years ago, and it's a football game, and some guy gets, I'm going to go with the word sacked, I think, I don't know, he gets <laughs> tackled and pinned to the ground. We had a lovely right. discussion about football before the show. I know <laughs> nothing about football. <laughs> Me neither, sir. He gets tackled and pinned to the ground and takes like a blow to the head, uh -huh. and he pulls off his helmet, and they're trying to, either like, are you okay? Are you okay? Do you know who the president, do you know who you are? Right. And he goes, yes, I'm back. Man, and then he runs off, and I have no idea what this has to do with Snickers, but it has to do with Snickers. Right, right. Because they have the Snickers logo at the end of the commercial, <laughs> and I yeah. find it obnoxious. But it's a little bit of a subliminal sticks. messaging sort of thing, and uh, and you know, it's kind of funny. It's a very it's a very snarky campaign because it does kind of mess with you a little bit. It's kind of almost an optical illusion thing. You're mm -hmm. so used to seeing the brown in that border that they can kind of shove anything in there, yeah. you know. And you they, still go, oh, it's a Snickers bar. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I'd love for them to just start shoving subliminal things in there, like consume more or something. <laughs> or, you know. I think those. Are pretty close to it. I mean, there was That's some true. weird stuff in it. It was just. Yeah, yeah, yeah those are rather bizarre, but they are showing the power of symbols, definitely, definitely. So, what do you think are some really effective icons? Oh, geez. Um, well, there's. Uh, some of the best icons are actually in the Mac OS X and the Windows Vista and 7 iconography. Mm -hmm. um, they got their resolutions higher and they've really sought to kind of bridge the gap between what software does and what it creates so that um, you see this on a on the Mac a lot that any software that is going to edit like a physical artifact so if it's like a word processing app it'll have a page mm -hmm. and if it's a uh, 
you know, this may be getting more obsolete, but iTunes has a CD and iMovie has film and all stuff. iPhoto has a picture of a photo. And I think that's great now that we have the fidelity and the resolutions and the color depth to show really good imagery. I love that they're just showing like, for things that come prepackaged with an operating system, they're just like, here's what it does. You know, no learning curve. You know, mm -hmm. I, I like the office icons, but there's a learning curve. Cause you know, when you install them, they basically have this very abstracted image of something. And on the Mac, it's even worse because they're like E and X and P. And work, if you know what it is, you know, you know what, what it, it is. is. Yeah, you absolutely do. And I guess that's solving another problem, which is it doesn't come with the computer, so you also have to satisfy the identity thing. So it's not like those are bad, you know. Um, but uh, but I really enjoy those. There's uh, an icon for a piece of software that I don't actually use. I just know the icon's great, called QLab. Um, and uh, the guy who uh, who did I can't remember his name right now, but he operated under the name the Pixel Implosion, and he actually works for Apple right now. And it's a gorgeous icon. But I also love, uh, probably one of my favorite designers of all time for the web is Dan Cedarholm, who has a company called Simple Bits. Mm -hmm. And uh, he does iconography that's very simple, uh, as as you would come to expect. And he sells icon sets through a, a thing called Icon Shop. Um, and those are all fantastic. And so are, there's a free set called Fam 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 that uh, if you do open source projects or if you ever want a big set of fantastic icons to mm -hmm. use in something they're free go grab them because they're really well done too so there's a bunch of them i mean i'm always seeing application icons that i wish i go kind of like i wish i could have done that but uh i have to say that the tastiest ones are definitely uh coming out of apple and um People might be surprised, but Microsoft, they've come a long way since Windows XP. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, in terms of design, you know, forgetting Vista, yeah. but I like 7. But anyway, that's a total <laughs> other rabbit trail. So, yes. <laughs> and if someone wanted to look at your iconography, where would they go? They would go to tylersticka.com. Um, uh, I don't have the McAfee work up on there yet, but I have, uh, I did an icon called Fire FTP that um, there was some request to turn it into a print. So it was actually made into a print at one point. It's a piece of file transfer software that you can install right into Firefox for free and the developer now works for YouTube and uh, he's a really good guy and um and some other iconography if anyone uses the Windows application launcher launchy um I designed the uh, the interface for that, but I also designed the icon, which is a UFO launching off a keyboard key. And, uh, oh, and I've seen that one. You have it. That one was really cute. Oh, well, thank you. And incidentally, <laughs> uh, the website was actually done by uh, our own studio audience member, Peter Woolley. So it's kind of, uh, <laughs> it's, it's all in the family. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, well, not a family, but anyway, uh, uh, colleagues. And we're going to lock them both in here until they fix the strains of live website. <laughs> <laughs> they think we're joking. But yeah, so there's a bunch of stuff on there. <laughs> and uh, also, I've been doing a bunch of iconography for Providence Health, believe it or not. So eventually, some patient tools and stuff you may be able to use. Uh, so it really does extend bunch. into all... Yeah, it's, it's both a branding thing and a user interface thing. It's kind of a versatile area that way. Okay. So, so we're going to make a jump. It's still We're still going to talk about something visual. Absolutely. Um, but... You gave a talk at Web Visions, and I've heard you reference things before about comics mm -hmm. and about animation and cartooning. Absolutely. And I want you to talk about that and about the importance of uh, animation and comics for children and about your own uh, comics work. Absolutely. Well, uh, um, that's a lot, so I'll just start somewhere. Uh, <laughs> just dive right in. <laughs> and your uh, your beliefs and uh, where you came from. <laughs> yes, exactly. Go. Um, no, so comics are tremendously important to me. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, I, I love them to death. I grew up uh, being a cartoonist when I was a kid in grade school. I always liked drawing. Uh, my mom said that my first two drawings were a balloon and a flower, and they looked exactly the same, and I would get really <laughs> mad if you couldn't tell which one was which um but i kept drawing I mean, that's pretty common absolutely yeah. <laughs> and uh, i kept drawing and uh, when i was in grade school a cartoonist named uh ray nelson jr who at one time was a uh artist at uh will vinton studios before it uh, became Leica, mm -hmm. and um uh, he had a company called Flying Rhino where he did these amazing children's books. And I think most of them are out of print now, but if you can track them down and you have kids or you're just an adult who likes really fun educational books about dinosaurs and sea life and everything, they're amazing. I don't know why these things aren't in print anymore. I just ate them up. I still do. I love them. And uh, he would come to grade schools occasionally and do these talks, basically, and show cartooning. And so he came to mine when I was in second grade. 
and just blew me away. I mean, he came in basically and he said something that was really important, which was, uh, in cartooning there are no rules, so just have fun, basically. And here's some tricks to help you get started, but if you want to draw a hippopotamus in a top hat riding a unicycle, you know, on the moon or something like that, you totally can. And um, what I'm seeing more and more, and I saw it a little bit as, uh, as I was leaving school and I saw it with my younger brother is that there are some amazing teachers out there but there's also kind of this weird thing where we kind of want to put kids in boxes a lot and we Mm -hmm. kind of want to put them into this sort of predefined role and and I'm afraid that kids are kind of being um, uh, trained to kind of ride the sort of mediocre wave if that makes sense to Mm -hmm. sort of uh, to sort of you know not imagine and I feel like the imagination is sort of leaving and um you know, I'll talk to kids, and uh, I occasionally do appearances at grade schools. I try to do what Ray Nelson did, and I'll come and do cartooning lessons. And uh, the kids are great, but occasionally there will be some. I know it's the most common thing is kids who go, uh, draw Bugs Bunny. That's immediately what they say, or draw this licensed character. Yeah. And uh, and it's sometimes really surprisingly difficult to get them to think about, well, what haven't you seen before? You know, And it's a question that is easiest for kids, that I feel is almost getting... Uh, trained out of them at an early age. And what I love about cartooning is it's so simple. You can do it with pen or pencils or finger paints or a magna doodle or something and uh, or an etch-a-sketch, whatever you want. And you basically just put your imagination to life. You know, it's like kids can play, but when you start drawing or whatever, you can find that the momentum of doing it carries you places you didn't expect to go. And when I was a kid, I still have a bunch of my old sketchbooks and, you know, God bless my parents, they have uh, so many of my old sketches at their house. And uh, when I look through them, you know, some of the most imaginative stuff I've ever done is in those old drawings and not bad ideas sometimes either. Not that kids should be thinking about that at all, but Essentially, so I'll tell them that cartooning has no rules, and what I really mean by that is that uh, um, cartooning and comics and everything, eventually, if you want to do them professionally or something, there are actually a lot of rules with composition and form and storytelling and stuff, but kids just shouldn't be worrying about that, you know? Basically, it's a kind of a vendetta against coloring inside the lines. I think that, you know, it's important to know how to color inside the lines, but it's not essential at all, and in fact, uh, I think that it's really special when kids don't in an interesting way that makes people look at things differently. And so, um, so I think comics are really important, and I also love comics because because they're one of the few forms of reading that kids will immediately just go to. They'll gravitate to. And that's really powerful. And it could be really powerful as an educational tool. And uh, and a lot of people... There's a great... Uh, um, a comic about uh, how DNA is uh, constructed and everything that you can get that's more for high school students. And it's great. I mean, it did a better job of explaining it to me than, than any science class did. The so. first thing that our daughter ever willingly picked up to read uh-huh. was a Firestar comic book. Oh, well, there you so, go. I mean, she reads all sorts of other stuff now, but she wasn't even willing to try the other stuff. But then Absolutely. you get the talking bubbles. Yeah. And suddenly it's accessible, even though the stuff that she was reading in that was much more difficult than the stuff that they give them to read. Right. She was still willing to put forth the advert to find oh, yeah. out what was going on in the Marvel comic book. Well, they've actually done studies and found that even when uh, kids are, or adults for that matter, are reading, even if it's a wordless cartoon, mm-hmm. because it's a sequence of images, it isn't going into the part of our brain that watches movies and TV. It's going to the part of our brain that reads because you're having to fill. It's very important because it's not just a lot of people think, oh, they're just looking at pictures. But there's something much more important going on, which is the space between the pictures. Kids are having to think and use their minds to figure out, you know, okay, in this panel, this person's here, and in this panel, they're now here. What happened between that? Which is a skill, it's kind of a level of abstraction, which it's a simpler level of abstraction than, say, language, mm-hmm. but it's it's linked. They're related. And so uh, it's a great way. Um, I actually uh, brought a couple comics that are fantastic if anyone um, ever wants to... Uh, to uh, get their kids hooked on comics. And one is, um, I wrote a blog post about this recently. I grew up loving Sonic the Hedgehog, and I played the Sega Genesis game, and he has one of the longest-running comic books in America right now. And when I was a kid, this thing just got my imagination absolutely going. It was colorful. It was funny. Uh, it's it's There's totally nothing in here that wouldn't be safe for kids unless I think they bonk a robot on the head every now and then or something. But, uh, but it's fantastic. And then for kids that are sophisticated, 
sophisticated enough to get like Harry Potter and everything like that, I uh, brought a book called uh, Amulet by an artist named Kazu Kibuishi, who uh, occasionally comes here. And Amulet is published by Scholastic, and uh, it's a fantastic graphic novel series uh, created for. Um, kids and young adults. Do you and, want to show uh, them to this camera? Yeah, right absolutely. Here? And I don't know if you want to just flip yeah. through those since you're closer, but uh, I brought those. I thought Kay would enjoy them. Thank so. you very Yeah, much. absolutely. There you go. That's good. That's good? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, these are good. There's another series called Bone that's also published by Scholastic and maybe turned into a cartoon at some point, too. But um, I'm telling you, they just uh, they inspired a lifelong love of not just comics, but reading for me. I mean, I just devour mm -hmm. books of any kind right now. And so, you know, we were talking earlier before the show about how great Pals is or something. And, yeah. you know, the first time I remember ever hunting through bins of books of any kind was going through comics book racks that like I think back when Target actually carried them or whatever they don't anymore but you know they got me you know thinking about it and then as I grew older you know I kept reading comics but I also started going through you know uh, it, it basically trains you to not be afraid of them I think school does a really good job of scaring you off books in a lot of ways so how do you think there there definitely became a there was a time when you can go to any bookstore yeah or any store and find comic books right and now, unless you go to a specialty store or one of the really major bookstores, you have to go to a comic book store to get most comics now. Right. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very strange thing where... Uh I think it's a little bit the comic book's fault mm -hmm. because what happened was they realized, you know, <laughs> who has more money, kids or adults? And adults did. And so uh, there were these great graphic novels in the 80s, uh, Watchmen, which obviously got made into a movie, mm -hmm. and The Dark Knight Returns, which is the basis for a lot of the Batman films. They're great comics, but they really drove home uh, to the, the publishers that adults had a lot more money to spend on these more mature series than uh, kids did. And uh, then what happened was, uh, was, okay, so then the comic book store, has, I think it was already coming around by that point, but uh, a Essentially, what happened is all of this sort of new interest and interest from adults then in the 90s bred this horrible speculator market where essentially all these people were saying that the comic books were a better investment than the stock market. Uh -huh. um, and not... And so people were just printing all these really crappy comics in the 90s, uh, just a zillion copies of them. And uh, everyone was buying them up thinking they'd be investments, but they don't... You know, it, it's really funny to me now because it's like... Things are only worth a lot when they're rare. <laughs> like, why would yeah. you? No one's gonna pay a lot for something that's everywhere, you know. And so, essentially, um, uh, what happened is the comics imploded, and uh, and basically the speculator market, which caused these little. I love comic book stores, and we have some awesome ones in Portland. But some are also just kind of really turn offish. It's like they don't really. They're almost like a den. I think Kevin Smith once said that they're they're set up den like and very cave like because they don't want you to come in and go. What is this? It's silly and like yeah. ridiculous. It. So it's a defense mechanism. So I think that um, as much as I love comic book stores, and if you're looking for good ones, there's a, a Excalibur in Portland is fantastic. And, um, oh, geez, uh, Floating World Comics, which is off of uh, Burnside, is uh, fantastic. Which, yeah. which side? Oh, geez, I'm terrible with direction. It's near the Pearl District. Okay. But, um, but yeah, and you can look it up online. I think uh, Twitter user ColorCubic uh, did their website. Um, but uh, uh, but they're great, too. And, and they're a really good one if you uh, uh, know nothing about comics because they set it up more like by genre and interest than like alphabetical or by mm -hmm. company or anything. Um, but uh, but I think that probably the last stand of comics in a lot of ways will probably be the bookstore. Um, I was looking today, and... Uh, there were actually two kids uh, looking in the graphic novel aisle of a bookstore, and that's a lot more than I usually see over there. And it's just a, it's a fact that they can kind of put it uh, out in the sort of mainstream view. Um, yeah. It's sad that they aren't in stores anymore, but it's kind of, like I said, it's sort of the major companies, like the people that do Spider-Man and X-Men, I love those characters, but they're decades old now, and they have yeah. all of this backstory. So I, I'm a huge comic book fan. I tried picking up an issue of Spider-Man, man the other day and I like I don't Can know what's going it. on. Yeah. I, it's like I could read it, but I have no idea. The history and the characters, it's like, apparently there's this big Civil War saga that went on that I know <laughs> nothing about now. And, uh, you know, it's difficult, especially now when you have to trek to a comic book store to find one, which 
I had a great one near me that went out of business, unfortunately. So, yeah. so that's sort of it. There's a bunch of stuff. There's also all the stuff where in the 50s there were all these McCarthy-esque hearings that censored them, that kind of, you know, cut them off at the pass in some ways. There's a bunch of reasons. I actually, it's kind of uh, one of I wrote two college thesis papers, one on interaction design and one on the state of modern comics. <laughs> and so I actually wrote a paper on why they're in such a sad state. I should probably post it online somewhere I if anyone's <laughs> yeah, if anyone's interested, I'll post it online because I write a big story of basically the downfall of American comics. But you know, in Japan, comics are a lot more prevalent. They're a lot mm -hmm. more public. Um because there's comics for everyone. You know, if you're into cooking, there's a cooking comic. If you're a businessman, there's comics about the uh, rise of successful business people. You know, and and I think that's something that Ameri the American audience has really missed out on in a lot of ways because uh, there are comics like that out there, but they're not nearly as prevalent. And people don't know about them, and that's one great thing about the web, though. Um, Scott McCloud, who's an idol of mine and uh, the inspiration for my graphic storytelling and new media. Um, presentation, uh, he did a comic about chess, because he's a big fan of chess. And what he found is by putting it online, uh, people who didn't like comics, but were just searching for chess, would find his chess comic. Mm -hmm. That shows tremendous potential, you know, because graphic novels are kind of in this ghetto of the graphic novel section, with the exception of the Pulitzer Prize winning Mouse, which is in biography. Uh, that seems to be the only one that's respected enough to get out of that sort of, uh, the, the sort of categorization hell that is the graphic novel section, because these things really should be put into their respective genres. You know, yeah. that's the only way people are going to find them. Otherwise, you're just going to, like I said, I love superheroes to death. I got a ton of them, but you're going to have to dig through a pile of Batman. You, you have to read back years in order to understand what's happening right yeah, now. Yeah, a lot of times. Not with everything, but a lot of times. Especially if you go to a shelf and all of it's Batman books. Where do you start? Chances are you're going to pick one out and you're not going to like it. You won't know what's going on. Oh, see, it depends on how particular you are, I guess. Yes. Because if I go to a shelf of books and I want to start reading it, yeah. I will go and find the earliest one I can. Sure, sure. But I'm really... Uh, here's here's another problem. Like these these companies, a lot of times, number one issues sell better than most do. So I can't tell you how many times I have people go, "Oh yeah, I have like Batman number one." Well, mm -hmm. it's one of like a zillion Batman number ones, like Batman like three subtitles number one. And so that's another hard thing. If you just go to the first one, there's like eight first ones. It's like where do you start now? It's yeah. just it's really bizarre. But um, you know, there's some good ones out there if you're into superheroes. You know, The Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller. If you're older, um, Watchmen's a great one because it's just one story. That's you have the beginning, middle, and end all in one book. The characters mm -hmm. didn't exist before or after, and so that's a fantastic one to read. Um, there are a bunch of other. There are good superhero comics. I mean, like I said, I love superheroes. I've probably got an inordinate amount of them as part of my collection, but uh, but they are in some ways part of what stunted American comics. We have to wrap up the tech episode, but I'm sure. curious. I'm not going to make you choose one, but what would be your f three favorite? Uh, comic books or graphic novels series? Sure. Um, one of my favorites, and people are usually surprised by it, is uh, probably my most favorite is a series called Guru. And it's by, uh, uh, I always get his name wrong despite the fact that I idolize him. He's my favorite cartoonist ever, but I always end up picking new ways to pronounce it. It's, it's uh, Sergio Aragonese. Mm -hmm. And, um, or Aragones. Uh, and uh, most people know him if you ever read Mad Magazine. He drew the little drawings in the in the margins, and he also did the silent cartoons. But he had a series, it was one of the longest running creator owned series, meaning he owned the rights to it. Uh, it was published by Marvel in the 80s and uh, Image in the 90s, and he still occasionally does it for Dark Horse right mm -hmm. around here. And, uh, yep, um, in Milwaukee. Yes, exactly mm -hmm. right. And uh, it's a fantastic series just because it's, it's one of the few series that makes me laugh out loud, and I laugh at it as hard today as I did when I was a kid and I find it's one of those great series where as a, you're a kid you just laugh at certain things and then as you get an adult you get a little bit wiser you to, and you start yeah. to get the other undercurrent of it and they just absolutely crack me up one of the funniest most expressive comics I've ever read and um uh, the other two, it gets much more difficult after that. But uh, but one great series is, uh, and again, it's hard to pronounce. I keep picking up, but it's Usagi Ojimbo by Stan Sakai, which is about to celebrate its 25th year. And uh, that's about a rabbit who's a samurai. Mm -hmm. But believe it or not, it's actually used as a textbook in some Japanese culture classes because he does so much research into it. So a great one, especially if you have kids, is uh, there's a volume that has a kite festival story. And it's a whole adventure, but it settles around a kite festival. And all the kites and the whole goings-on 
on of the festival, it's all historically accurate. Uh, accurate. It's just uh, happens to be rabbits and animals Very instead cool. of humans. So um, that's fantastic. And then probably the third would probably be. Uh, it's a very controversial series, but it's, it's called a Cerebus, and it's the longest running human narrative of all time. The guy spent thirty years uh, making it, and he wrote, drew. Did you talk about this in your? Yeah, I talked to him about about him a little bit. But what's really interesting about it is uh, Dave Sim is a brilliant guy, and uh, and but he's also a little bit of a reclusive fellow, and he um, has opinions that not everyone's going to agree with. So uh, if you go beyond the first few volumes, I would definitely take it with a grain of salt and realize, you know, it's that classic thing of like, was Cassavetes a genius or a misogynist? You got to go into it with the separate the art from the creator and just kind of take it as this amazing journey of. Um, it, uh, apart from any of that stuff or any of the opinions he injects, like I, I hate saying that stuff, but I have to, or else people think like, do you share his opinions? And no, but but just keep all that stuff out of your head and just absorb the story because his storytelling is some of the most sophisticated and deep and just craziest roller coaster rides. Like as a story, I think it uh, stands on its own and it's really long, so you do well just picking out a few good volumes. There's uh, the two volumes, Church and State, which I would warn people has a lot of religious and political commentary and satire <laughs> in it, but um, but they are uh, some of the craziest volumes with the most like cosmic repercussions and everything on the face of the planet. And it's all with fictitious religions and stuff like that. But it's just questioning the nature of beliefs and of putting people in certain positions of authority and everything. And then it goes into this whole thing where, you know, eventually he meets these supernatural powers and it's just absolutely mind blowing. So, um, I have a zillion comics. Those are the three that I picked off the top of my head. If you ask me any other day, I might give you three different ones because I love them. Uh, if you ever want comic suggestions, uh, tell me some movies you like or some stuff you're into. Um, I guarantee I can uh, I can tell you some that you'd love. Uh, anybody, because they're they are that varied. You just got to know where to look for them. All right, Tyler. Thank you so much for joining us. You can thank find you. Tyler at Tyler Sticka on Twitter. Yeah. Or Tyler Stick Tyler Right. All right. We'll be back with after hours in a few minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you.